Welcome back to Mastara, everybody. This is actually my second attempt at this video because I did not like the quality of the first video and I'm not going to ship a substandard product. So I threw out the original dialogue and I'm starting over. You selected as today's topic the looming trade war between Derek and Minerthad. This video does use the alternate 1005 timeline I mentioned in a previous video, so Alphacia and Alfheim are still around. Just about everybody else has had a mud hole stomped in them after the War of the Master and the War of the Spheres. But let's jump into this meaty topic right away. I'm Mr. Welch and today we're talking trade war. Our two contestants are obviously Minrathad and Derekin, the two nations of coin. After the war, Minrathad is stronger of the two financially, stayed neutral through both wars, and more importantly, sold to both sides of the alphacia thyatis conflict, and even sold to Derekin when they were being pushed back the hardest by the Hulian forces. They provided absolutely no military support to anyone in the war, charged full price, and even tried uh, territorial expansion into some islands that were disputed by Thyatis. Derekin, on the other hand, is well regarded for not only fighting their own war, but paying everybody else in full. Derekin was practically leveled west of the Streel River, which includes most of their actual territory, despite being halfway through the nation. Derekin is heavily rebuilding under the pragmatic leadership of Corwin Linton, their new chancellor. So that's the way in of the two combatants. One is intact yet dis despised, the other one is half broken, but the crowd favorite. Each nation has access to markets the other does not. Minrathad is nautical in nature, her access to landlocked nations is practically nil, but she does have a monopoly on trade from the Alphacian Empire, the city-states of Skothar, and the Isle of Dread. Derekin's exclusive markets include Alfheim, New Angmar, Glantry, and Rockholm, plus the goods of the Bear Clan and the other plateau-dwelling Etrugan. Irindi is only accessible by sea, but it's close enough to Derekin's ports that their smaller merchant fleet can still turn a profit in that nation. That means the current markets the nations are fighting for for market share are the Turtle Clan of Etrugan, the Northern Reaches, though occupied Auslan does prove to be a challenge, the War Ravaged Sind and the Five Shires, the newly emergent Karamikos, Rebuilding Thyatis, and then there's Yalaram and Irindi. New markets they're both fighting over include much of the Savage Coast, including the nation state of Slagovich, the trading powers of Texarius and Villa Verde, and the trigger happy Cimarron for the guns, as well as further kingdoms like Eusdria, Renarde, and the lands of the Orchid Peninsula and the Serpent Peninsula. The nation of Ethengar was largely left originally to Derekin, but because of their sack of the master's camp during the war, the nation has undergone a massive surge in wealth, causing Minerad to open up a trading post in the Heldon Freeholds to try to access their market. This war is very much a quiet war. Minrathad is not invading Athenos anytime soon. Derekin is not putting boots on the ground on North Island. Instead, there's two levels of war being waged by the Derekin Diplomatic Corps and the Minrathad Thieves Guild. The first war is a diplomatic war where the weapons are espionage, blackmail, and bribery. If an interested nation needs a large shipment of lumber, both merchant nations are going to try to find what the other nation is offering to undercut the rival but blackmailing either the rival trade minister or the buyer's agent are not out of the question. In addition, kickbacks are always a tool to persuade a buyer's agents to reward a favorable contract. Of course, plot hooks characters can be sent up to dig up dirt, protect secrets, or use good old-fashioned persuasion to win over the potential buyer. It's a low-conflict adventure that's good with a lot of drama and introduces you to the power players of Mastara. The other side of the war is the shadow war fought on the docks, in the streets, and in the warehouses. This part of the war is very less than legal, where sabotage, theft, and piracy are the weapons used. The nations have to be extremely careful on this end of the war. Not many people get killed trying to bribe a trade minister, but when you start burning down warehouses or ambushing caravans, deaths are a possibility. Burning down a warehouse in a foreign country gets you a hard time for arson. Burning down a warehouse in your rival's port gets you hung for sabotage. Neither nation is going to risk the political fallout of having their own agents involved in wanton acts of destruction, so they're going to subcontract. This is where a lot of the adventures are going to come from. There's not a privateer in the Five Shires that's going to be without a letter of mark from one or the other merchant nations. The smarter captains are going to have a letter from both. There's a spike in highwaymen and pirates that only pounce on Derekin caravans or Minrathad merchantmen, but smile and wave at travelers from other nations passing, passing by. Most of the agents abroad are going to be proxy hires for, from spies. They will leave nothing to trace back to their nation of hire. But both Minrathad and Derekin pay very well and, more importantly, take care of their agents. If you grab luxury items from a rival warehouse, your handler is already going to have transportation for the item and probably you as well waiting before the job even starts. There's going to be a lot of false flag operations trying to discredit the rival nation where the party intentionally is trying to fail but then leave evidence implicating the rival nation. So that means there's a lot of work for characters to protect and to stop the saboteurs and privateers. So it's not all morally suspect work. 
there is a lot of adventuring work of the traditional sort as well because the nations are going to try to showcase their ability to acquire new goods or objects of art. If 4th century Trolodarn art becomes the latest craze to hit the halls of Alphasian nobility, you can be sure that both nations are going to sponsor adventuring parties to loot every dungeon they can find across Karamikos, and many of the adventurers will be a race against a rival party trying to loot the dungeon before someone else can get there. Both sides will pay handsomely for new maps, new rudders, and anything else that decreases the time to get to a new market. Mastara is about exploration, and nothing inspires you more than knowing that you're getting well paid for it. If, you're going, if you come across a new market, then your price just went up. This kind of campaign means the party is never going to stop moving as they try to expand the boundaries of the known world even further. There's a lot of dangers in the trade war, not just from people wanting to burn down the building the party is guarding. You've got two rival nations beginning to churn out massive numbers of goods in to corner the market. That means local merchants and farmers are going to have to watch markets flood with foreign goods, and that means it's going to be harder for them to sell in their own nation. So you're going to have to watch out for angry locals that really don't want you there. Then you've got corrupt customs agents shaking down the party, or in worst case scenarios, entire shipments being seized by them. At the largest scale, the two nations have to watch out for overstepping their boundaries, because nations like Thyatis are weakened, but still far more powerful than Derek and Minrith had militarily. Embarrassing Emperor Eusebius or loaning out too much money is risky, because Thyatians are well known for their treachery. If either nation oversteps their bounds, Thyatis can fabricate an incident to give them grounds to seize territory or goods, and then use that to leverage down what they actually owe. Of the new markets that both of them are vying for, there's advantages and challenges to both. The Turtle Clan's biggest export is cultural uh, artifacts, but they don't sell those because they're sacred to their tribe. So what they have to start doing is they just start creating the items without the ritual ceremonies that make them special. So they're selling replica totem poles and golden ones to the two nations that are buying them at exorbitant prices. The trade war has in effect created the first tourist trap. The Five Shires was decimated by the war, especially by the ravages of the Tiger Clan. They're a poor nation, but they're also a fertile nation. They have to pay back Derekin and Minrithad with cuts from their future crop sales, which threatens to leave the nation even deeper in debt. Derekin is the Shire's closest ally. It's been giving them deep discounts with their help. Minrithad, of course, is giving no such deal. The issue is, Minrithad is much better suited to supply the Shires with the aid they need. So it's a trade-off between Minrithad as Wire Mother and Derekin as Soft Mother. If you don't get that reference, go look up Harlow's Maternal Needs Study on Rhesus Monkeys. I spent money to learn that information in college, and damned if I'm not going to use it. Karamikos and Irindi both have the advantage of being largely untouched by the war and having their power increased by their strong showing. Karamikos has become one of the most important nations in the region simply because Diatis and Derekin were crippled in the war. King Stefan can negotiate from a position of power, which gives his people favorable terms. The downside, of course, is it makes it harder for local merchants to make a profit, something he's going to have to address in the future. Irindi is hurting because their tourism uh, industry took a downturn after the war, but with the trade war raging, they're able to turn a profit on their merchant nation simply because they don't need much in supplies and the wealthier merchants spend all their money wantonly on Irindi beaches. Thyatis is the kingmaker in the trade war. Emperor Eusebius is looking to expand the empire, which means he needs foods and supplies. The merchant that can win these contracts to provide the, the goods is going to become fantastically wealthy. Of course, as mentioned earlier, dealing with Iatians is risky because they will betray you if they think they can get away with it. So you have to balance the money that you could possibly make with the chance that you're going to get cheated out of all of it at some point. Yalarum isn't much of a market for Minrithad. First off, Yalarum doesn't like Minrithad. They view the merchants as without honor, so their traders don't trust them. Second, Derekin has a long and storied alliance with Yalarum. Which is saying much as Yalarum tends to be isolationist. Still, there's a market for Yalari goods, so Minrithad merchants are going to be there, but they're not going to have an easy time haggling for them. The Northern Reaches are a bit of a wild card because Vestland is trying to become a p trading power in its own right. Oslan is still occupied by Thyatis, and Soderford is just a bunch of squabbling nobles. Vestland, however, has some of the best sailors, and their merchants are getting better, and they can reach ports normally restricted to Minrithad. The other problem is Vestlanders aren't slouches in combat. Only the best or foolhardiest pirates would ever attempt to seize a Vestlander merchant vessel. A lot of the dirty tricks that Minrithad and Dara can play on each other don't work very well against Vestland because Vestland will defend itself. Ethengar is a popular trading spot because of their new wealth, but both nations have to deal with the fact that Mogulay Khan is quite intelligent and knows the value of what his nation now has. Plus, the penalties in Ethengar are much steeper than other nations. Because of this, Derekin and Minrithad traders have to be very careful in dealing with the Ethengar, or else they'll have their trade delegations thrown out of the country. But the big money is in the Savage Coast. Despite Cinnabarl being toxic, there's a massive market for anything made out of the metal. The other game changer is firearms that are introduced because of smoke powder that's only found on the Savage Coast. 
Now, they're vastly too expensive to become common weapons in the known world, but for prestige items, their value is often greater than that of powerful magic items. The biggest issue with the Red Coast, of course, is the curse, which makes trading there hazardous and very unpopular amongst the caravan and merchant ship crews. Of course, both Derekin and Minerthad have staked out large portions of Slagovich to help coordinate trade in that region, to the point of the locals are worried that one of the nations one day is going to show up with a mercen mercenary army just to formalize the takeover and boot out their rival. All of the dirty tricks that Minerthad and Derekin have been using in the known world are almost out in the open, so that's a problem with Slagovich. So who wins the trade war? Does the trade war even stop? A ton of money to be made when Minerthad decides to corner the market on as many markets as possible while Derekin is weakened, and Derekin has to ease its rules on Dirty Pool to survive. At the height of the trade war, there's not going to be a single mercenary, pirate, or brigand not in somebody's employ. The adventurers won't have a problem finding a patron. There's always a market for whatever gems or objects of art they pull out of a lost temple or dungeon. The f war will probably flame out once the post-market uh, economy is uh, stabilized, and both nations will come out richer than before. But for the brief time when Minerthad and Derekin are pulling out all the stops to increase their power, it's a good time to be an adventurer. I'm making some changes to the voting. If something doesn't get 10% on the vote, it's going back into the pot to simmer for a bit so new topics can be proposed. Didn't want something sitting at next to last place for months if it's not that much interest in it. On a side note, I'm still proofing the Mastara Player's Handbook. The religion section took a lot longer than expected, but hopefully that will be finished and sent to the printer this week. Then in a month when I get the book back, I will show you the greatest Mastara video ever. Then everybody shares this, spreads it around, and hopefully we can get this on the DMs Guild for everybody to jump on. But until then, remember, he who has the gold makes the rules.